Maintenance people galore. But none could reopen and enter through the doors to the House of Representatives or the Senate. And even though the doors had multiple glass panes, the idea of breaking a window seemed to be very extreme, much more than if the hinge of a door is drilled off. The senators for the most part appeared comfortable when the maintenance crews left the room after the unsuccessful realignment of the desk. The actual anxiety level of the congressman could never be ascertained, even on a good day. Unfortunately, what the maintenance crew could not see was worse than they could expect, because the confined politician's concern was quickly changing from annoyed to panic. Their phone calls to relatives and acquaintances after the doors failed to open showed them being bothered but jovial. Once they discovered the doors were immovable, the panic set in. Unfortunately, by this time, communications with the outside world ceased. While at the same time, aside from what is going on in the room, the appearance of the glass displayed nothing out of the normal, but at closer inspection there was now a cold hardness that the carpenters and maintenance crews never felt before. And the cold touch on their fingers brought back memories of times in the past when these men couldn't possibly have lived. But the images were so sharp that it made it hard to imagine that these men didn't have a connection to this past. One person, though, standing idly by, had had enough. As he walked over to the knob on the door, where he grabbed hold with all his might and had the intention of tearing it off. Unfortunately, within the framework of the door, was a pent-up energy that wasn't going to allow his bravado, and a pulse of energy exploded for everyone to see. And at this moment the man literally was launched like a missile across the hall. The man now unconscious was a new spectacle in the hall where special attention was being paid to the man's rubber insulated work boots signifying that the energy expended was not electrical in nature and the realization spread that to open these doors was not going to be easy the room apparently has developed a defense mechanism against intrusion and the phenomenon was further indicated when other individuals tried tightening drill bits into a drill to remove the door's lock, but once engaged, the bit would escape from its locked-in position, striking a picture of a representative or senator on the far walls behind them. Scolding was the only discipline necessary to correct this latest situation, because the maintenance individual that had handled the drill had not tightened the drill hard enough. So the next, and the next, and the next maintenance person tried. But all this resulted in was a mass of drill bits sticking out of the many pictures of politicians located on the walls behind them. The amount of maintenance people grew to almost 20 when the problem of the locked doors first occurred. But as each person tried unsuccessfully to penetrate the door, they understood that they had tightened the drill enough and that something else loosened the drill bit. So as they watched their supervisor struggling to get the door open, they slowly stepped back and soon away from the whole ordeal. They knew nothing was going to break those doors down but they didn't want to be present when the mystery hidden within soon became reality. The worst that could happen right now is that the politicians caught inside had a lot of time to think and sleep 
and think again. The current administration in D.C., though, is in shock because they don't know how to handle a hostage situation take a place in the Capitol building when there's no known perpetrators to the deed. No one to negotiate, no one to hold accountable. So the dilemma quickly becomes a military matter. But their solutions were not readily available either. Do we use mobile battering ramps to knock down doors? Or maybe C4 high explosives to create a hole for escape? Finally though, a decision is made. And it is simple because it requires only a small group of military members to safely detonate a small charge outside the gallery doors without harming any of the inside occupants. Unfortunately, this decision brings up a different concern, and that is who is more valuable to the United States. And after a brief moment of consideration, those in authority concluded the members in the Senate chamber deserved a more reserved response. Maybe the explosion went awry, but what would it cost them in the long run? One or more representatives? If it were a rich representative, sadness. If it is a poor representative, elect another. But hopefully, whoever bites the bullet will be from states that did not matter and only took up room. Regardless, though, an attempt to rescue is still necessary as a small amount of C4 is placed on the door to the House of Representatives chamber. The ease of the attempt becoming more complicated because there is a lack of communications from within the room. And even though the United States are experts in electronic warfare that control an enemy's communications, we ourselves cannot discover the source of the interference affecting our communications with the House members inside. In fact, we have found that the source of interference is coming from the center of the chambers themselves. And being that our country no longer values an agent's trust or integrity to make the right call, we have taken away all responsibility from them to act on their own. If a higher up of honorable status cannot make the decision, then a decision will not be made. It has been beat into the world though, as well in DC, that all efforts are applauded but failure is not an option. In other words, we will delegate our responsibility to you, our underlings, where your success is our success. But failure to succeed is yours totally possess. We will sleep at night while you will sit in front of a congressional hearing. Unfortunately for the supervising authority handling this small rescue attempt in progress, when the composite explosive was detonated, it decomposed into a liquefied mist mix that simply ran down the face of the door. The EOD technician who set up the charge and was humiliated at its lack of sizzle was forced to brave a closer look at the unexploded mixture. But he got closer his mind was no longer concerned and as he stood by the door with an explosive no longer solid, he performed the unexpected. As he leaned down and touched the finger to the liquid, but he didn't wipe the, fing the liquid from his hand to be safe, he simply placed his finger in his mouth to clean it. But there was no sign of discomfort on the technician's part, 
but rather he smiled because he tasted strawberry jello without the red food coloring. He smiled, his vindication secure. The supervisor of the detonation squad steps out of the building to reevaluate his options but embarrasses himself as he finds he can't re-enter the building. And when he tries to call his next in command to open the door from the inside, he finds that his calls go unanswered. The man, totally perplexed at this point, is literally standing in the snow, which has been cleared to some degree because of the situation unfolding but he is further shocked to find that he is not cold at all. It is quickly confirmed to him that all the doors leading into the halls of Congress are being sealed shut. Unfortunately, what is true to one person might not be true to another, because without any effort whatsoever, a total stranger, a bystander, suddenly walks through the cordoned off line and up the steps. But for whatever reason unknown, the sentries posted at the doors just stand there looking as he starts entering the building. And unfortunately, the sentries realize their error too late because the moment the man enters the building, the doors shut tight behind him. Federal agents were then posted at the door, awaiting his return, but finally were called off when it was decided that no one who entered the building was going to return. So for this reason, the agents a short time later were totally shocked when the man exited the building, and having no one else to take out their frustrations on, they confronted the man after his return. But the only answer they received as to why he entered an area of investigation is that he needed a drink of water. The agents can only ponder his response as they look down at the ground surrounding them all, where it is covered with tons of clean, unused water, snow. The circumstance surrounding the incident is kept quiet because too much is happening in too little a time to be coincidental. This is not an attack on a country, but rather only on a privileged city-state. And where does it stop? And how far does it go? The concerns and questions of the Capitol Hill take over quickly merged into totally bizarre without a lack of reasoning and the question arises who is the key holder for all the locked doors the windows likewise neighboring the chambers that only utilize latches cannot be opened and even if it was possible no one ventured forth to pick up a chair to break a window so all you do is stand there and look at the window panes mired in ice. Rumors are spreading to the civilian populace outside the affected zone that higher ups in the military sent in a group of specialists to force open the doors with any means possible. But the explosive utilized could not open the doors to the House of Representatives and San Chambers. And the one witness the supervisor that survived the ordeal is quickly discredited. In no way is his version of the events that transpired possible. C4 does not liquefy on contact. Infrared equipment has been brought in to locate their missing military members and scan the different halls for the politicians contained within. But the heat-seeking devices cannot find a trace of warmth. 
It is understandable for the military because their equipment does a lot to deflect infrared rays. But surely one of the politicians confined brought their heart to work. The scanners, though, trying and failing to find a living soul within the entire complex, proved to be a search in fertility. And even though they were unsuccessful in their task to find a human life, the equipment started to react in an unforeseen manner by burning themselves out. The equipment's demise, though, didn't occur because of what they couldn't find in the building, but rather of what they found on the outside. And this discovery occurred when their operators, who were standing outside the building in the ankle-deep frozen water, focused their equipment in every direction to find out why they wouldn't work and suddenly found that the very snow they were standing in was radiating warmth. And to a viewer looking through infrared goggles, it appeared that the whole world turned pink. One piece of military equipment down brings in another. Could an armored tank blow a hole in the building? Yes. And one was being delivered up until the point that the soft snow tore a shoe off the track, which redlined the entire vehicle. Was there time to get another? Maybe yes, but would the results be any different? Matters seemed to be worse than expected because some former terrorist had to have taken control of the hallways and in some way surprised the rescue squad before they reached the two chambers. But what is mystifying is why there were not any shots fired and no radio communications once they entered the building. The military higher-ups decide to send in another squad, but like everyone else, this team of men couldn't do any better in getting in the front door of the Capitol building. Apparently, these terrorists are sealing off all the entrances as they find them. So another entry method has to be sought. Unfortunately, the weather was too bad for helicopters. So the next elite special operations detachments would have to virtually scale one side of the Capitol building so that they could drop down on the other side. This they decided after considering climbing up to the lowest wind available to them, but felt that the terrorists carrying out this hostage situation would see their approach. So they decided to drop down from a higher perch instead. Unfortunately, the methods of repelling down an obstacle taught to them at Fort Bragg were found to be unusable by the soldiers who were attempting the rescue as they repelled down the side of the ice-covered Capitol Dome to enter a hallway or corridor near either of the two chambers. Unfortunately, every time they found as they prepared to break an outside window near the Senate chamber or the House of Representative, the rope would go slack, dropping the soldier lower than necessary to be effective. One soldier, though, thought he found a way that he could swing out enough to where he could manage to crash through a nearby window and free the politicians imprisoned there. Unfortunately, on his inward thrust, the rope simply stopped in mid-flight, losing its flexibility, and the soldier dangled only inches from the window pane. The soldier's desperation quickly became apparent because with all his training, the involuntary limberness in his harness and ropes were never anticipated. 
so all he could do was put his hand out and touch the window, but with not enough strength to bust the glass, and an explosive charge set off so close it would end his life too. The strainness, the strangeness of the rope's conduct mortified the warrior, because with all his training he forgot he had a knife and a pistol. But after the fact he wondered if they would even work if he had have used them. This soldier was not new to killing. But an enemy firing back with a weapon was one thing. But how can you kill something you cannot see? This personal failure, though, in accomplishing his mission, was not all of the soldier's concern because he, in fact, was suspended in the air outside the dome with only the hard, icy surface of the capital steps below and a merciless heaven above whipping him with snow. So he started his climb, hand over hand, back up the rope to the snow-covered roof where he started. But once he arrived, he found the snow was absent on the surface of the roof, even though the snow was whipping around his face. And just as odd was the fact that he was standing on solid glass that wasn't there before, where he could look down and see the faces and activities of the scared politicians in the chamber below. The soldier spotted one congressman looking back up towards the ceiling and the two men stared straight into the face of each other. And there was no sign of amazement on the congressman's face as he looked directly up at the soldier standing directly on a ceiling that used to have its interior coated. A hapless look, though, appeared on both the men's faces as the soldier felt his mission was somehow compromised by forces unseen. But once the soldier left the scene of the roof and reached his point of origin, he took no time in sharing his displeasure. But his supervisors thought they had the upper hand as they cajoled him into trying once more. Unfortunately for them, his mind was already made up as he took his rope halter off. But this time he took his superior's displeasure in stride. If you want to enter that room, you have to do it yourself. He then brushed away the snow hitting on his face as he walked away from the uneasiness face in his country today and forcing back bravado the man had to make a soul saving assertion towards his own conduct something was in that room i did not want to confront russian eyes though are still questioning events as they are unfolding in D.C. because they have one agent watching from the snow-covered street below as he annotates comments in a book. For what reason is this country's Congress having a sleepover? And he continues to write, They do not get anything accomplished during the day so why would they think that getting something done in the middle of the night would make any difference? He snickers. NSA cannot read my words on paper. <laughs>